So um, we're right. So I th thought we'd um, cover this. There's a heap of different programs um, available for astronomy. They're not just um, tools for controlling your telescope imaging, as if you're familiar with astrophotography, there's a lot of different software items you use for that kind of thing. Um, things like astrometry, if you're into that, measuring the positions of things in the sky. Um, any serious work, there's always going to be some software behind the scenes. But we also have, when we're starting out, these are really great tools to learn your way around the sky and also to learn ter terminology. So the one we see here is called Stellarium, and it uh, runs on Windows and um, Apple and Linux. This one's running on a Linux machine at the moment. So whenever you, if you've never used one of these before, um, the first thing you do when you start it up, it will want to know where you are. Um, you don't have to set it to where you are. You can set it to anywhere on Earth and it will show you the sky in that location. Generally, you probably want it at your own site to see what's going on. So um, you can also um, tell it things like um, the um, surroundings. If you see that ground there, this particular program, you can put your own sort of background image representing the ground. I've just used one of the default ones. So it's drawing the sky more or less as you'd see it from your site at that time. So the other thing you um, can do, go to the date and time. By default, this one will start off at the current time. I'll show you in the settings, you can also turn daylight saving on and off, whether you um, want it to use the local mean time or daylight saving time, that kind of thing. So it's trying to... Um, map the sky in real time and you can't actually see it updating but it's actually updating the, the frames as the uh, clock ticks over. So the, there's a heck of a lot of features in this program and I'll just show some of them. We um, come into the um, settings menu and you see there's various options for the sky there the brightness of the Milky Way, whether you want to see the zodiacal light and how bright it is, things like that. You can even um, put shooting stars on it by, oops, if I drag this slider, you can create artificial shooting stars. <laughs> kind of fun if you're doing some kind of presentation or something. And you've got um, details on how to display the solar system objects. You can show the trails of planets, so you can see the um, orbits, that kind of thing. And deep sky objects. And you notice on this one, you've got a heap of different catalogues that you can specify. Um, the default ones here, the M, short for Mesia catalog. If you're not sure what they are, you just um, point the mouse at them and it comes up with a little pop-up. These are the really common ones, the Mesia, the Caldwell Catalogue. If you haven't heard of the Caldwell Catalogue, it's a catalogue of deep sky objects that's concentrated on the southern hemisphere. Um, the Mesia Catalogue, of course, Charles Mesia back in the 18th century was in Paris. So a lot of the southern objects that we look at, they can't see from Paris at all. So you probably... Um, it's quite good to turn that on. New General Catalogue, which is uh, um, basically Dreyer Catalogue. It was new about 130 years ago. Um, still retain the name. And then the Index Catalogue, which is sort of like an addendum to the, the New General Catalogue. And you can see, you can only show certain types of objects in the field and we have markings, and there's a heap of options here. Um, just look at a few of the interesting ones. We can turn on the equator, and we can also, for example, show the meridian and the ecliptic. And you notice, um, if you can see that on the screen, like with the ecliptic and the equator, we can um, say of 
J2000 or of date. And what the of date means is though these two are lines across the sky, the, ellip the ecliptic is the path that the sun appears to pass through across the sky. And the equator is basically projection of the Earth's equator onto the sky. But when you look at them relative to the stars, the stars are all moving against those. Um, and it's because the Earth is actually wobbling around on its axis. It takes about 26,000 years to do one wobble. Um, there are other wobbles that are going on. Even the Earth's orbit wobbles slightly. It's a much slower wobble than the, um, the wobble that the poles go through. But we can turn those on. So if we um, oops, get it to, what's it doing? Get rid of those. We can turn on um, various lines down the bottom here. If you're trying to find objects in the sky, we can show stick figures of the constellations. If they don't mean anything to you, you can um, show artwork. And the artwork can be um, different cultures around the world. This is sort of the, the Western traditional art, which is mostly based on um, Greek and Middle Eastern constellations. I'll just um, go back to the, not that one, I'm sorry. Back to the markings. Try and see why that didn't turn on. That could be a. I think it's the middle or the left line, isn't it? Oh, have I, have I clicked the wrong one. You're quite right. Hang on. Has that turned uh, equator and meridian on? Yeah, that's, um, we'll get it eventually. <laughs> uh, there we go. Actually, I, um, I'm not sure what the three rows for. I should, let's hover over it. No, it's not going to tell us. That's kind of strange. Selected the wrong ones. Okay. Get rid of that, and I'll just turn the artwork off. Um, but w another thing we can turn on is, we're not sure if familiar with the night sky, we can actually put on the compass points. So you can see we're now oriented with the north, south, east, west and so on. So the green line there is what's called the meridian. And every place on Earth has its own meridian. You've probably heard of the prime meridian. By convention, does anyone know where you'd have to be to have that going straight over your head? That's right, at the Greenwich Observatory, I believe there's a marker on the ground. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so um, basically, um, the meridian divides the sky into the east and the west. So, for example, um, if I switch around to the south, See, the meridian goes right across the sky. And I'll just zoom out a bit. And let's choose a star here. So this is the Sagittarius, Chaos Australis. And it's bringing up um, quite a lot of information about the star there. So the first thing you see there is the magnitude, which tells you the brightness, if you're not familiar with how this works. Originally, it goes back to the Greek astronomer Hipparchus, who came up with a, a system of ranking stars in terms of brightness. So the brightest ones, first magnitude, and the ones that you could just barely see on a, on a really good dark night, a sixth magnitude. But it's pretty subjective. So, but for historical reasons, they tried to keep the same system but make it a bit more scientific. So the modern system of magnitude extends beyond first magnitude. For example, the sun is about minus 26. Um, the fainter stars in the Hubble Space Telescope long exposed is probably magnitude plus 30 or even, even bigger. So every time you jump five magnitudes, that's about 100-fold in brightness. So 
first magnitude stars are about 100 times as bright as the sixth magnitude, and so on. So that, that's a bit of information you can get there. The other thing here talks about the colour index, and that is basically relates to the surface temperature of the star. So what they do is they image the star with two different filters, a B, which is a blue filter, and a V, which is visual, and you measure the brightness in those two filters, and the difference is called B minus V, and that allows you to tell basically how hot the star is. It's a substitute for temperature. You can see here that um, this one is, is minus 0.03. If we look at really, um, a really blue star, um, Beta Crucis, it's got a um, colour index of minus 0.25. But we can go to, um, so if we choose quite a reddish star, Antares and Scorpius. In fact, you notice it actually changes the colour of the information, <laughs> basically based on the colour index of the star. And you see that this has got a positive colour index, which means it's quite red. So that's... Um, fairly standard way of um, measuring the colours or the surface temperature of stars. Um, some other important numbers here, you've got the right ascension and declination. And you notice again we've got the J2000 and the on the date. So J2000 were the coordinates back in the year 2000, so it's a standard time. And what the program is doing, it's calculating the change between the year 2000, which is data stored in the catalogue, to the current time. And that's how it's calculating those coordinates. You've also got um, HA, which is our angle, declination, and the altitude and azimuth. The azimuth is just basically the compass bearing. The altitude is how high it is, so zero at the horizon, 90 degrees when it goes through the zenith. And you can see that um, the altitude and azimuth are changing quite fast. And similarly, the hour angle. But the others don't really change much. And you'd only notice changes in them over a long enough time for the precession to be noticeable. So the other thing we can tell is going to explain about hour angle. So. Let's go back to the south and we'll pick a star. Say Alpha Centauri there, or Rigel Centaurus, as it's officially known now by the IAU. If you have a look there, you'll see the hour angle. Can you read that? Okay, it says one hour and nine minutes. So what the hour angle is telling us is how long since the, the star passed the meridian. So... One hour, one hour and nine minutes ago, Alpha Centauri was right on the green line. So this is quite useful. If you're doing astrophotography and you have an equatorial mount, if you have to flip from one side of the sky to the other and you notice oh, the hour angle is an hour, you can go off and have a cup of tea, but you'll have to come back and do what's called a meridian flip. Otherwise, if you don't, what happens is your camera is probably going to crash into the pier or the tripod. So. Some mounts um, can actually, the way they're designed, can actually go past the meridian without a problem, but it, it just depends on your setup. So um, uh, there are differences in programs with our angle. This one um, is, works on a 24-hour basis, so if we come to a star on the other side, over to the east, you notice the hour angle here is 23 hours. So it's going to go back to 24 and then reset to zero. So it's a, like based on a 24-hour clock. But I've noticed some programs do it a different way as plus and minus 12 hours rather than zero to 24. So that could be confusing. They'll say it's a, an hour east or an hour west if it's using that system. So that's just... Um, to explain what some of these numbers mean. Um, it gives you the distance, the constellation that it's in. Notice here it says that this star is circumpolar 
and that means that it never sets if we, um, we can turn on what's called the equatorial grid. And so the centre of the grid there is the south celestial pole. And if a star is on that circle there, then it just goes round and round the sky on that circle. So that star, um, Alpha Triangulum Australis, it will never see it, it just goes around and around in the sky. And that happens to any stars until you get out to this about here roughly. See this star here is Canopus. That does actually see it, but only just for Auckland. If you go f f further south you go, the higher in the, in the sky it will be and it will um, miss setting. Okay. I won't say anything more about the grids. We're going to uh, actually. I'll turn the grids off because they're a bit distracting. Okay, so we're going to um, come in here and we can turn certain things on. So we want to have this one here is deep sky objects. So you notice some things have popped up on the screen. We want to label planets. So you can see we can zoom in and out, and the more we zoom in, the more stars and the more things come into view. How many stars there are? When you first download it, this program, um, you first install it, it goes down to about ninth or tenth magnitude. But what you can do, and, and you can tell it to download more data, and the more data you download, the bigger the files get and the more stars. So I'll, I'll show you how to do that um, when we get to the settings screen. If you um, notice some symbols here, I don't know how well that shows up there, but that's like a yellow circle with a cross on it. Does anyone know um, what that generally indicates? Probably the name helps you. If you see any, any of these star mapping programs, they have standard symbols. So a circle with a cross for it like that. Does anyone tell us what it is? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I haven't got any chocolate fish to give out, unlike Chris. Um, so this one here, you can see sort of a, an oval shape. What would that be? Yeah, those, one, those ones are galaxies. So we'll just um, have a look at some other things that we can see here. So this one here, is that showing up okay? It's basically a, a, an, a circle made up of dots. So what, what would that one be? Star yeah, that's an open star cluster. And the difference between open star clusters and, and globular clusters is globular clusters are really old stars, probably um, formed in the early, early days of the formation of the Milky Way, and other galaxies have these globular clusters as well. Whereas the, um, they have a lot of stars as well. Some of them can have more than a million stars in them, the globulars. The um, open clusters are generally a lot newer, a lot younger. They have less stars because in the more modern era the star formation rate is lower. So um, the stars are younger, so it means you'll find that the um, open clusters will often have a lot of really young hot stars in them. Globular clusters tend to be old yellow or reddish looking stars. We'll just find another type of object that shows up. Um, you see this one here where um, you'll see things like um, a little green square. Any guess on that one? Um, yeah, it's kind of a, what they call a H2 region or sometimes called a bright nebula. So in other words, it's a, um, giving off a lot of hydrogen alpha light and and, um, and um, it's because it's being lit up by really hot stars. Um, 
here's an example here, which is the um, we're in this area around. Um, actually, if we pick this one, Caldwell 82. So you can see um, this program. Some of them will just show the symbols, but this program will actually try and render a bit of an image of the nebula. So some of those are helpful. I'm just going to zoom out because I'm going to look for a particular symbol. Okay, you can actually see that there, so you, you can probably guess. There's a, a green circle where the little spikes on the outside indicating a planetary nebula. Different programs may have different colour for these, but generally the symbols are, are quite standard. Does anyone want to tell us what a planetary nebula is? Exploding star. Not really exploding. It's basically a, a star that hasn't got enough mass to become a supernova, but it's reached the end of its life. It can't, it's got no more hydrogen or helium fuel left to burn in its core. Core ends up becoming carbon, maybe a bit of oxygen and nitrogen. There's no more fuel, basically, that it can burn because it doesn't have enough to kick off burning of carbon and nitrogen. And as it's finally compressing down, it has one last burst of energy that throws off the envelope of the star and it forms a really nice object called a planetary nebula. I don't, I don't know if um, this one renders very well. It sort of tries to a little bit. So hang on if I can... Yeah, no, that's really hold on, I'll try and um, centre the thing before it takes off on me. Where's the... Uh... Oh, there we go. Yeah. So um, a lot of these, if you look at pictures on the internet, they have really um, unusual um, shapes, and it can be because of the magnetic fields of the star or its rotation rate. Sometimes it'll be a binary, and it can all affect the shape of these nebula. Um, they're really interesting to look at in a telescope and maybe in photographs as well. But the interesting thing about them is they don't last very long, and maybe 30,000, 40,000 years this will have dissipated so that it'll get fainter and fainter. You won't be able to see it anymore. And you can see um, there's quite a lot of stars. I think I've gone down to about level 8 um, in, in this program. Um, if we zoom right in, we can see what the faintest sort of stars, what is it saying here, for the magnitude about... So I've gone down to maybe 14th, 15th magnitude. If you go down, load up more catalogues, you can go down to about 20th magnitude. So... So the way that a lot of people, if you are wanting to do an observing session, you have a look at what's in the sky tonight, maybe just scroll around the sky, have a look at what things you might be able to see, you'll get a, an idea from, for a thing like a cluster, give you a magnitude, if it was magnitude 14, probably wouldn't be worth trying to go after it on a telescope, with just visual, you won't be able to see it. But something like this one, Fifth magnitude should be no problem in, a, in an amateur telescope. So it's quite useful for planning your observing sessions. And I'll just show you a few of the other things you can do with this. We go into here, which is the uh, main settings window. You can tell it what um, method it uses to calculate positions. Um, might as well just um, leave the defaults unless you're doing something special. You can um, show what info is displayed. And there's various other extras you can turn off and on. And you notice at the bottom there, this is where you um, can get the next catalogue. So I've got the first seven. Um, if I click it again, I'll get catalogue number eight. And it's telling me that if I do that, 
um, the file is just under 300 megabytes. I could do that, but generally um, those stars are not going to be able to see in any realistic amateur telescope, they're just too faint, but you will see them in photographs, so if you're doing astrophotography you may want those fainter stars to be able to identify them in the field. And we can, um, there's various tools here, the way the thing's displayed and different um, options. The other thing that's quite interesting is plugins. Some of them are quite handy, like you've got a, an angle measure plugin. What you do there, I don't know if you've used Google Earth, where you can draw a line and it'll tell you the distance between two places on the Earth. Well, this is a little bit similar, but you draw the line, it'll tell you the angle between two objects. Quite useful if you know how, whether something's going to be in the field or not in the field. There's actually probably a better plug-in for that called um, yes. Oc Oculus. Yes, the thing. Oh, yeah, that's, that's this one called Oculus. So if you, if you enable that plug-in... Um, and it's set, I've got it set to load on starter. We can click the configure button, and um, there's various things we can put there. But we can tell it which eyepiece we're using. So, 40, let's say um, um, maybe a uh, let's say a 26 millimeter, 52 degree field plot or. And we might go, you can, uh, we'll do it with cameras as well. You can say the size of your sensor. But we're going to tell it the telescope. Um, hasn't got an Astron's telescope in here by default, but you can make out your own. Yeah. So um, you just tell it the, the focal length and the um, diameter of the mirror. And then what you do, let's zoom in a bit. We're looking at the moon. We've got the symbol here. Oops. Oh, okay, I must have it set to um, set to a camera at the moment. So we want to um, change that to an eyepiece. And where do we do that? There must have been a default that I missed. It's the lenses. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a Telrad. That's the lens. Finally got it. So that's showing us. If we looked at that point in the sky and whatever um, lens and the telescope we'd set, that shows you the field of view. One thing I'm not so keen on this, I'd rather it just showed you a circle rather than blocking out all the surroundings because some of the programs that do this will, will just draw a circle and then you can see where you're looking, but you can also see what's around it. But you can just um, turn it off and then you can um, see the surroundings. Now, this is one of the newer features in this program. So um, there's a whole lot of things. Um, you've got um, positions of things, Moon, Jupiter, Saturn, and you can add, you can add other stuff. You've got, um, you can do ephemeris calculations for a particular object. For example, see the one I've got selected there as a comet? So if I, I don't know, just select any comma and then you can tell it to calculate the ephemeris and you can, um, it's telling you um, the um, from date and the to date and time and you can change how often it does the calculations and you can actually get it to draw on the map the path of the comet on the screen so you can see how the comet's moving in the sky um, if we look at this one, I wouldn't bother going for this one, 24th magnitude. <laughs> so you'd need a really big telescope and camera to image down to that. But that's um, quite a nice feature. Um, if you hear about any new comet that is in the news or whatever, you can go into this program. Um, on another screen, you can actually download... Um, the Minor Planet Centre data on new comets, and it will tell it you want to update all 
can select comets or asteroids and then it will uh, be able to map them in the program, chart them. Um, you can calculate um, phenomena, um, like you can select a planet and it will show you um, conjunctions between planet A, planet B or an asteroid, any of that kind of thing, if you're interested in following those. Um, under graphs, well this is because I've got that um, cluster se uh, selected in the, on the main map, it's showing if I'm observing it, the, um, the altitude as the time as we go around the clock. So this one actually never actually sets. You can see the, it's a circumpolar object and you can see if you're doing imaging it's, or even visual observing, you say, oh, there's no point in observing it until it gets to a certain altitude when it's out of the, out of the murk. And you can see on this chart um, straight away, OK, I, I want to start looking at this at 10 o'clock at night or, or whatever the time might be. Um, that does indicate the um, yeah. So um, yeah. So that's the meridian passage. If we highlight over there, it actually tells us, and that's where it is now. So it's past the meridian and is getting lower in the sky. Let's go out of there. I'll just go back into here. The way you get the comets is the solar system editor. So you can see, we can come into here and it's got a list of the comets and we can say input orbital elements, you can select either asteroids or comets and then we can um, select the bookmark. You can actually add your own if anyone's providing a service on the internet so that that's giving data in a format the program understands. You just put the um, internet URL. But the one, it knows about a few of them there. Minor Planet Center, list of observable comets is quite a, a common one. And then we just say, um, get the elements. And, and we can say, mark all of them and add the objects. You know, it's quite useful to tell it to overwrite any existing data because over time they will correct the elements for comets because comet orbits are not easy to predict because they're outgassing the orbits. Over time they'll gradually change so they have to keep, keep their database updated. So if you want the most accurate data, um, it pays to, especially if it's a comet moving through the inner solar system where they're moving quickly and they might be getting um, effects of Jupiter or outgassing as from their tail and that kind of thing. So this is quite a good um, freeware program. So it um, runs on probably most systems you'll have, but not on mobile. So for mobile phones, there are a lot of apps as well. Um, some advantages for the mobile phones is that you don't have to tell it where you are because usually if you've got a smartphone it will know because of its GPS um, receiver. But you can still um, tell it to go to other locations. So um, what I'm going to do here is just um, show you an example of a mobile phone app. There's lots of them, some of them free. The one I'm going to show is called Sky Safari. It's not a free one but it's quite inexpensive but one of the better ones around because it has heaps and heaps of information about the objects you want to look at. Um, so to do that what I have to do, just give me a f few seconds. Um, I think there might be a free one on Android but, but it's not, it, if, you, if you want to get all the good data it's better to get the, I think it's called the Pro version. There's isn't three it? versions, the Sky Safari, Sky Safari Plus and Sky Safari oh, Pro. The, the Plus one is probably more features. Yeah. Each one you go yeah. Plus is the one that I would recommend and I think that's one that Bill's using. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, got most of what you would generally need. You can share 
chair the observation list. Yeah. So you can start it on uh, your one phone and transfer it to. So what I'm going to do here is connect my laptop to the phone so I can show this on the screen. Hopefully this will work and it's not going to be blocked. Phones are easy to hold up because it's guy to on the computer. Okay, right. So, um, I believe I can in here. Uh, how do I do it? Let's have a look here. Don't want camera. There was a scheme in here for actually showing this on the screen. I should have checked this out before. Uh, what do we got, mate? Summary. Oh, damn, this is going to be a bit hopeless. We used to have a... Uh, See what happens if I try and start Sky Safari from here. Did, did you see it? Yeah. Yeah, three or four because I'm twice. You can also search for it. Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh, actually, you got it's strange. It shows two different versions. The bottom one is. Oh, so you get both, obviously. Let's see. Oh, that's only... Um, oh, damn, I wonder if they took it away. I didn't actually check this. It used to have a way of showing the, tele the screen of the phone. No? Oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah. I can do it off the uh, off the phone. Uh, no, you can do it off live on here. Oh, okay. Oh, you've got Sky Safari online. Oh, one thing I was going to show with Sky Safari, like most of the phone apps, because the the phones have a tilt ex and accelerometer on them, you can actually aim the telephone at the sky, put it in what it calls compass mode, and it will basically tell you what you're looking at. I was hoping to show you that, but it's not going to be possible. There's a lot of um, different free ones on the app store on both Android and um, iOS as well. So the, the one I use is Google Sky Map. Yeah, that's, and that's okay. a free yeah. one as well. And you can move the phone around and it'll show you what you can see in the sky. Okay, you can, you can see that... Um, it's showing you a relatively similar looking screen to um, what we saw on Stellarium. But these programs, if you put them into, obviously we can't do it with the laptop, but on a smartphone, you can put it into compass mode and then aim it at the sky, that kind of thing. But the other thing I wanted to show you with this, um, oh, you... Um, you get heaps of, um, as well as the basic coordinates and stuff we saw in Stellarium, we can go into more, and uh, is that where you do it on here, Steve? No, it's not that one. How do you get info on this? Oh, maybe... It's not that one, no. Might just be... That one probably doesn't have any more. Oh, oh, maybe it's just showing you on that panel. So probably what we want is a deep sky object. Or even actually the moon will be interesting if we... Oh, yeah, so... Yeah, on these ones you... Um, you get um, a lot of extra information, which is um, really quite cool. I'll see if I can find a deep sky object to show you. Uh, what would be a good one? Oh, okay. Is it, is it going to work? Two fingers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, doesn't seem to be working. You need to be inside of the Oh, I see. 
Yeah, it's, it doesn't seem to be doing it, it's just rotating. Let's try. Yep. We could try plugging the mouse in and using the scroll wheel. Sure. Or just double click on it. Probably... You've got plus and minus there. Use plus and minus. Oh, okay. Like that. Do I need just scroll through? Oh, no, no, it's in there. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Thanks, Steve. Wrong mouse. <laughs> Wrong mouse. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we select this one. We've selected an NGC object there. If we can get it to do that. No, it's selecting stars still, hang on. I'll scroll in a bit more. So, see if it will select. Okay, so, and we want to go uh, information. Oh. No? Oh, here we go. Oh, that, I haven't shown, shown some very good examples because <laughs> I need a deep sky object. Hang on. Mm, if we just zoom in, then it goes. Yeah. 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 What is it? Oh, here we go. No, no it's gone to a star I'll, again. I'll try it. You have a go, Eric. Let's just, go, let's just go a bit closer. Makes it a bit. So click on it and then click selection on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. Select. Oh, okay, and then object info. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. to do it the yeah. long way. So, yeah, so th this program you can see um, a gives it often a picture and a bit of information telling you about the object. Hey, Bill? So, yeah. Uh, can you get the extinction magnitude of that program? Yeah. Um, I do, does Stellarium do that? Actually, the, the Stellarium does. What he's talking about is when you um, have an object down low in the sky, it'll have a, a magnitude that's extincted by the amount of air. So it might be magnitude 1 when it's straight overhead, but down near the, when it's just above the horizon, it'll be a bit dimmer because of just the amount of air you're looking through. Mm. Yeah, this one doesn't seem to have that, does it? got visual magnitude, visual. but it doesn't have ex extincted mag magnitude. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, um, in terms of um, this program, there's some other cool things you can do with it. You can, you see it's got an um, icon for scope there. You can connect it up to telescope. And if you've got a, a mount that has a Wi-Fi interface, you can actually drive your telescope um, from your phone. I think um, you paid a trick on somebody where you had a, a mount and a phone set up and and they told him though that it was a voice um, response yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody was hiding with your mobile phone, selecting an object and hitting go to. Somebody would say Saturn and the mount would go to Saturn. <laughs> I'm sure it's probably uh, not that far before you will be able to do that. Yeah. Um, the other thing here, um, and I didn't show that in Stellarium, you go into night mode. So this is quite important if you're outside observing and you've got your phone or your laptop with you. You don't want a lot of blue light because it's not good for your night vision. It takes you a while to recover. So it changes the display to all red and quite a bit dimmer so your eyes aren't getting blasted by the, the blue light coming off the screen. Some other interesting things you can do, we'll try this. I'll select this cluster again. And we can, has this got the fly to thing in it, yeah. Steve? Yep. Yeah. Where's that? It's just on the bottom when you can it up, you can with it. Uh, maybe not. 
there's a f feature on um, the mobile one where you can fly out to the selected can, object. Uh, you can select an object and do orbit. I yeah, yeah, I, I don't see. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw it. I can try. We'll just turn off night mode for now so it doesn't look. So it goes selection. Oh, okay, it doesn't bring it up on there, so yes. orbit object, it was there. So now, basically, the program's flying out to the object. Hey, oh, we probably picked the wrong one. Yeah, so it was, wasn't a good one. Let's try a planet. Oh, a planet, yes. Oh, yeah, you better go back to Earth. Uh, I think we should be able to jump straight there, eh? Try Jupiter. Oh, your yeah, Saturn's a good one. <gasps> Saturn. Well, okay. Saturn Nebula as well. But let's go. I did work. This one should work quite well. Hey! So th those features are quite fun. There's a few different programs that will do this sort of thing as well. And you can scroll around as Eric's doing here. Look at different angles at the planet and the rings, various moons and so on. I think we could potentially just. Well, yeah, I'm let's fly sure. to the moon and have a look. Pretty sure we could. So hey. do a search for moon. Moon. Oh, there a, it is. That's a lot of moons. <laughs> Too many moons. Okay. We can see Orion at the background. <laughs> okay, side. so it's not. A, uh, actually, it is on the dark side, yeah. but it, it shows it actually as being. Well, it's not. There isn't really a dark side. There's a, there's a side facing the Earth and the side away. Yeah. And the side away is in the sun just as often as the side facing. Yeah. Well, actually, we can see at the moment the moon's about um, quarter phase, so we are actually seeing some of the side away from the Earth there. Mm. So there's some um, craters. craters on the on the uh, far side. If we come around this way, this is the more familiar side. So they're quite good educational tools as, uh, for, as much as anything else. So I guess um, I haven't got too much more to say. Get, get hold of these programs, especially Stellarium is free. There are free ones on the mobile devices to play with. And you yeah, just explore the settings and scroll around looking for objects. Oh, one thing that's oh. quite handy with Stellarium. Yeah. Um, somewhere it had a um, Tonight's Best. Uh, Does it have it on here? Under search, tonight, maybe. It's got the Tonight. Uh, tonight, I think, is there. Yeah, no, uh, tonight, yeah. Oh, oh, Tonight, yeah. yeah. Click on it, yeah. Yeah, so, oh, the sun's obviously not very good for tonight, but it tells you. <laughs> In order, I think it's in order. You're right. Yeah. Coming out. yeah. So um, those those are um, all planets actually. ISS and Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. It's been shown tonight. It's been shown tonight. Based on selection, I think. All oh, right. Down. The, hang on. We go. Um, let's go. Uh, oh, and here, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. Let's just click on it. Let's scroll up there. Hey. Okay, so it's showing you the um, Messier objects and so on. <coughs> so that's quite handy if you're not sure what to look at. It gives you some ideas. Okay, I'll um, probably leave it at that. Are there any questions about um, these sort of programs in general or specific questions? How, how many year calendar has that still there in bottom? Um, I think it goes, you mean how far in the future and the past? I think it's a few thousand years. Um, can we go back onto yeah, the other we'll computer? Oh, it's that side. There you go, thanks, Steve. I'll get rid of this thing. I'm not sure why the option to show the screen of the mobile seems to have disappeared. Um, quite a useful thing in here. We can go 
as people were asking, we can go a long way forward in the future. Actually, let's go to about 9,000. And there's a particular reason I did that. We scroll out. And um, go to the south. Turn on the equatorial grid. Oops, wrong one. And you notice that um, we've actually got a nice um, bright star near the South Pole. In fact, I didn't put in the exact year, but a couple of hundred years to one side of that, um, this particular star, which as you see there is second magnitude, the Southern Hemisphere gets a pole star. <laughs> at, at the moment, the brightest star near the South Celestial Pole is um, Sigma Octantis. It's just above six magnitude, virtually impossible to see from Auckland. Um, and it makes polar alignment a bit tricky. You can see it in binoculars, but in the Northern Hemisphere, they're lucky to have Polaris. But if we... Um, let's go to, um, say, um, somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Actually, I'll, let's go to London. And we've jumped into the daytime, so we have to change our clock. Okay, so let's look north. Scroll out, and you see there's no, no pole star for the northern hemisphere, so people out there will be grumbling about having to <laughs> <laughs> the, the difficulty in life. Well, it never does, but let's um, do a search to see where Polaris is. No, I mean from London. See how far it is from the, the pole? <laughs> so um, this is basically caused by the precession of the, the Earth's axis as it's wobbling around. Um, it basically takes 26,000 years to get back to where you were. So if we... I don't think the program will allow you to go that far into the future because the data starts to get more and more inaccurate, and especially with planets, um, the calculations start to get a bit dodgy um, when you go a long way into the future or the past. But yeah, that's quite interesting to, to um, people who are interested in matching up historical descriptions of um, things where the planets were in a certain position. You can go and check it out in these programs, quite interesting. Interesting one there, Bill. Sorry. Yeah. Is if we learned about this one night here about uh, if you looked at where the sun was, what constellation it was, and when I was born, uh, if it was if that was two thousand years ago, my star sign was, was Cancer. But actually, when I do it now, at nine sixty five, where I was born, the sun is in the constellation of Gemini. Yeah, that's right. That's that's also because of this precession. Yes, yeah, so I'm not really a cancer. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, this is quite an interesting. If we look yes. at, I've turned on the constellation boundaries, and you notice, um, compared to the current day, we can zip back and have a look. Notice how they're skewed. Um, at the moment, or back in, I think the year 1900, the constellation boundaries were set so that they're basically the boundaries are either lines of constant right ascension or constant declination. So they would have been um, aligned with these lines, but you see the angle that they're at there, and that, that's also because of precession. So um, stars actually won't stay in the same constellations because of this either. <laughs> They'll drift in and out and over time. And this is a different effect to what's called proper motion. So th this... Um, boundary changes isn't because of the actual motion of the stars, it's the Earth's motion. But they, these programs are also calculating the proper motion of the stars. So because the stars and the sun are all moving around in the galaxy, 
um, if these programs are doing their calculations correctly, um, we might be able to actually see a difference if we go back to Auckland and have a look at Alpha Centauri. Oh, get that out of the way. Zealand. Hey. Yeah, it's daytime again, but 7,000 years ahead. But we'll um, go back to night time. And um, let's um, zoom in and find, actually, see the, um, it looks quite different at the South Pole. It, yes, let's go and um, do a search for Alpha, whoops, whoops. Alpha Centauri, will it let me do that? Alpha Sen. Oh, there it is. See, it's miles away. And um, you can't see it much there, but there would be, if you compared, um, you would see that there would be a noticeable um, difference in position relative to the Southern Cross. In fact, you can see the Southern Cross there is even slightly skewed from what it is now, and that, that's due to proper motion. So some of those stars are a bit closer, so they're moving more rapidly. It's actually um, a tricky thing because um, you've got these coordinate systems. We talk about right ascension, declination, and they're all changing relative to the Earth. Even the Earth's orbit bobs up and down on a really slow time cycle. So the problem is everything's moving. So what do you use as a reference point? Well, the, the modern way of doing it, they actually use distant quasars. So originally they figured out the position of the quasars using radio telescopes. But now with the Gaia satellite, it's got about over a million quasars that it uses to create the coordinate reference frame. So if you download the Gaia catalogue, which has got well over a billion stars in it, the astrometry there is locked to these quasars that are so far away that you can't perceive any, any motion. So uh, if you want to do real precise astrometry, that's, that's what they have to do. Everything else is bobbing around in space and going every which way. So, um, yeah, you can learn some quite interesting things from these programs. So, before we finish, any, any more questions? Just a simple one about the, the symbol. Is there a key anywhere that's key to reference? Um, some of the star charts will do that. Like, if you get an actual printed star atlas, they will have a, like an index page that tells you what those symbols are. I don't think they do on the programs, but probably don't need it. Like if you, for example, click on this cluster here, it kind of tells you what it is. There is a legend in here. Oh, there could but be. I'm okay. not quite sure where it is. I yeah, yeah. Seen it. There's a heck of a lot of different settings and things, so it could be in here somewhere. Has it got something like that? Um, deep sky. Has it got anything about the, don't see it in that one, markings maybe? Yeah. Oh, oh, the other thing is, as well as Western Star Law, we can do, we can select New Zealand Maori Star Law, which is, um, so that, um, that will show some of the names of um, stars like uh, Puanga, Mat Matariki and those sort of things. And there's a whole lot of others you can see, Navajo, Noors, and, and so on. And if you, some of those will have art artwork associated with them, so you can turn on the art artwork for that particular culture. Uh, well, yep. what about the uh, old cross? Where would that be in uh, several thousand years? Uh, well, that's interesting. It won't be too far from here, so... We're, um, uh, hang on, I'll turn all the deep sky objects off, it'll probably be easier. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, so okay, so this, this is the Karina area. So um, I think it's this one here. It's no longer the Dolls Cross. Yeah, well, the, the Diamond Cross is this one. It hasn't changed too much. You can tell the Diamond Cross because it's got that star cluster on Theta Carina. If you look, it's sometimes called the Southern Pleiades. Because if you look at this in binoculars, it looks similar to Matariki. Um, so that they don't look a huge amount different, but their position does look to change relative to the Southern Cross, do you think? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Okay, did we get, was there any online questions? So, okay, we'll wrap it up. Thanks very much for coming along.